Hello, my name is Eamon Dean and I'm Chairman of Hollywell Trust and also of Foyle River Gardens. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate Elaine and her team for bringing this great event together. It's astonishing, astonishing what you can do with technology. So well done, Elaine. It's a really important event and I think made all the more important. It's important in and of itself, but it's made all the more important by the fact that the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister's representative today have introduced this, introduced this as it were, as the first formal recognition of the need for the new government, or relatively new government, to become more involved in peace and reconciliation work and building relationships between the two sides of this divided society. So I, I think that's really important and hopefully it's the, the beginning of a new era for us all. So very positive, I think. Now, many years ago now, Pauline Ross came over to see me one day when I was working in Hollywell Trust and she said, she outlined this idea about bringing a woman with a very strange name, Taya, to Derry to do this work based on the work she had done with people in death row. How extraordinary could that possibly, a piece of theatre built with prisoners at the end of their lives. And uh, I thought it was really risky. But Pauline was all for it and enthusiastic about it and said, we need a partner, will, will you partner us? Sure, we, we, we'll go for that. And not quite knowing what it was we were buying into. But yeah, let's take the risk. Let, let's, let's go with it. And we're very glad we did. I'm very glad that I did because I met uh, a great friend in Tia. And, and uh, I think we will see that our friendship, not that this is about our friendship, but... but Nevertheless, friendships happen, and within friendship, then all sorts of creative things can happen. So I'm delighted to say today that, and, and I will introduce my friend, Taya Sepinuk. Taya is the most ex extraordinary woman. She's Jewish, and she's a Buddhist. That's, that's not a combination that you meet often in Derry. It's not a combination that you meet often anywhere. She's a dancer, she's a the theatrical producer, she's a writer, she's multi-talented, and above all else, she's the most extraordinary listener that ever you will come across. So Taya is going to talk about her, her work in the formation of Theatre of Witness. She formed Theatre of Witness out of her own soul, heart and soul, 35 years ago. And so we're going to listen to Taya now, and afterwards there's a bit of a conversation. Hope you enjoy it. I know you'll be fascinated by it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Taya Sepinuk. I'm the founder and artistic director of Theatre of Witness, and I'm speaking to you today from Philadelphia, across the ocean from my beloved Northern Ireland, where I lived for five years, seeding the Theatre of Witness program. And I miss all my friends there, and I send you all lots of love. Thank you, Elaine, for making this conference possible. So Theatre of Witness is a form that I developed uh, about 35 years ago, where I bring people together across divides of difference to share their own true stories on stage, with them being the performers, about their lives living through trauma, war, marginalization, oppression. Sometimes the people in the performances are people that have been perpetrators, sometimes they've been victims and survivors. But always this work is about what is the common humanity? What is that place in the center of the wound where we all want the same things, which is to be loved, to be known, to be safe, to be free? This work is, um, takes tremendous amount of courage from the performers who mine their own stories. And it takes a lot of careful listening to listen to the imagery and to find what I call the medicine in the story. 
and that may be the place of accountability or transcendence or even the place where somebody just stands up for the first time and gives voice to that story that they've held inside that may have caused actual uh, injury and illness or shame. And um, there's a great bearing witness that happens, the bearing witness for each person individually as they share the story that they may have hidden, the sharing that they do with each other in this great sacred group that we create, and the sharing that they do with a larger audience where I feel like we create a container where people can listen with the ears of their heart to somebody that may possibly have once been perceived as an enemy. Today I'm gonna to focus a little bit on the work in Northern Ireland and then some on the work in Philadelphia where I've most recently worked with police and people of color. And I'm going to start with a piece that I made in Northern Ireland in, in two not 1900s, 2010, called I Once Knew a Girl. It had six women whose stories really had been hidden. These are stories that are often women's stories and weren't the ones that were up really strong during the Troubles. They weren't the ones that were heard. They weren't the ones that were celebrated. And um, bringing these women together was uh, really a risky procedure. We had uh, two people in particular who I'm gonna focus on, Kathleen Gillespie, whose husband had been murdered by the IRA, and Ann Walker, who came from a Republican background who had actually been in the IRA. And I have to say, uh, creating the environment where we could bring them together, even though both of them had stayed up the night before crying and not being able to sleep, um, they have now become great friends. So um, I don't know if I wanna say anything else at the beginning. These are just excerpts that are woven together, uh, some with some uh, interview. All of this footage was uh, generously given to us by Margot Harkin, whose wonderful film, The Far Side of Revenge, was a documentary about this work. And again, this is I Once Knew a Girl. Dear Mrs. Gillespie and family, I have never written to anyone before like this, but I wanted to let you know that there are people worldwide who feel for you and focus their love on you. Having seen the horror of what the IRA have done, we wish to send you our condolences and wishes. Mr. Gillespie has not died in vain. One day there will be peace. Our father's family was killed in the Treblinka concentration camp in 1934. A sympathizer, Australia. I remember meeting a fellow in you when I was 18 and he said something about joining the IRA. I said, joining the IRA? What are you asking me for sure? I wouldn't know who to ask. He said, Anne, I'm not asking you to help me join. I'm asking you to join. To tell you the truth, I get such a rush that he thought that I had something more to offer than marches and demonstrations. I said, I don't even have to think about this. I know what I want to do. This time, they chained Patsy to a van loaded with 1,000 pounds of explosives and forced him to drive it to the army checkpoint at Kosh Kwan, where it was detonated by remote control. Five soldiers, as well as Patsy, were blown up in that explosion. We are definitely in a safer place. But everything is so fragile. I think everything is so fragile. Um, now is a good time for peace and reconciliation and lots of healing to be taking place. You know, sometimes people say to me, don't you worry that you're going to open up something really awful or really hard. What they do need to know is that you won't be scared by what they open up that you are not going to find it unbearable, that they can say whatever they need to say and it will be okay. Within two minutes I was crying and my whole story came out and I felt as if I'd been burst into telling my story anyway. It was bursting out of me. I knew nothing about the Theatre of Witness, absolutely nothing. I had um, two or three interviews with Taya in which she listened to what I was saying, took notes on what I was saying. She gets together such a diverse group of people and they, they all work together in harmony and it's, it's magic. <laughs> this is what we do before we go on. Rescue, rescue remedy. The troubles consumed me and it probably affected me more than people realise and more than I realised myself. For me, I think the personality and the person I am, it was inevitable that I, that I would end up in the area. But I stayed over at my granny's house a lot 
her and I, we'd talk about how we'd sort this country out, how we were on the right side doing the right thing, everybody else was doing it wrong. But the Brits and the police had us terrorised. And over the years, we knew loads of people that had been killed, hurt, or arrested and taken away by the Brits and the police. But when my granny talked about her son who was killed on Bloody Sunday, she talked about him with great pride. It's, it's easier in some ways to, to identify with a survivor, um, but to be able to identify with a perpetrator and think, you know, had the, my life experiences been the same, I, I could be in those shoes. One particular night, I was called to man an explosives device. That day, I'd had a really sore head, and I didn't want to do this. Not because my head was sore, but because I'd been a quartermaster running guns and explosives, I'd never been directly involved in, in having to kill somebody. And that's what they were asking me to do. I never said no. When I went to meet the fella that was doing the job with me, and there were steps for me to climb up, and as I was climbing those steps, there was a god-awful pain in my head. It was as if Somebody had hit me in the head with a hammer. I got round to him and he said, Jesus, Anne, what happened to you? I don't know. My head's a bit sore. You better go home. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here with you. But within a couple of minutes, I was throwing my guts up. Anne, you have to go. Don't worry about this. I'll look after it. It doesn't look like they're coming anyway. And he made me go. It transpired that I'd had a brain hemorrhage and ended up needing full brain surgery. My father held my hand in hospital the whole night long, watching me throwing up blood, not knowing whether I was going to live or die. In the life that I was living, I could have ended up dead. Bombs, bullets, I could have ended up at life in prison. How hard would it have been for my daddy to hold my hand then? And I believe that God works in mysterious ways. It was one hell of a mysterious way to get me out of that situation. The Brits were never going to come that night because an informer had informed on the whole thing. What would have happened is that we would have been lifted, shot, arrested. They knew we were there. The Brits were never going to come that night and I'm glad because even though I wanted to be part of the cause and the justice of setting Ireland free, it was never in me to go so far down that road. It was never in me to be that type of person. Is it really in any of us? When I went into the room and I seen Kathleen and I knew who she was and I nodded at her and she nodded back and um, I was physically shaken, physically shaken and close to tears and thinking, right, how's this going to go? It was strange sitting there wondering which one's a hairy woman now, which one's a hairy woman <laughs> And then we started telling bits of her stories and Anne started saying, and she looked straight at me, you know, and I thought, all right, this is her, this is her. Now, the hardest thing for me was to try and contact my son in England before he saw it on the news. I want you to come home, son. She know I've got my ticket, ma'am, coming home in December. Ah, but I need you to come home now. Why? I'll tell you when I get you home. I'm not coming home until you tell me why. That's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life was to tell my son on the phone that they'd murdered his daddy. I can still hear him screaming. I'll kill those bastards. One night, about a month after Patsy's death, there was a howling wind, lashing rain. I couldn't get to sleep. The branches of the rose bush outside my bedroom window were scratching on the glass. I thought it was Patsy trying to get in the window. So at three o'clock in the morning, I got up and put my coat on. And I went out and I cut that rose bush right to the roots. At the inquest, they talked about numbered body bags. And I realized they didn't know what was in the coffin. I had dreadful nightmares about Patsy being put together wrong. I couldn't get to sleep for the nightmares. It was horrific. One night, I propped myself up in the bed and I took out my book, put on my glasses. 
I was terrified to go to sleep. I looked down at the door, and there was Patsy. Now, I wasn't sleeping. I was propped up, I had my book, and I had my glasses on. I looked back down to the door, and Patsy was standing there, wearing the grey cardigan he had on when they took him away. Look at me, girl, he said. I'm okay. Now you go to sleep. And that was that. No more nightmares. By the end of me telling all these women what I could of my story, the tears are running down my cheeks. I turned around to Kelly and she just put her arms around me and gave me a big hug. And uh, she cried and I cried. Um, and I thanked her and she told me it was okay. And I couldn't believe it. Back then, I didn't know any better. I didn't see the bigger picture and I didn't look to the future to see what could possibly happen. And if I'm really honest with myself, being a quartermaster, moving guns and explosives around the country, then I was directly responsible for the deaths of people in this war. That's hard to take. I need to learn to forgive myself. Now, 20 years have passed, and I continue my work with ex-combatants. I'm still fighting my case for justice, and I won't give in. My family have grown now, and I have four beautiful grandchildren. My eldest son wears his daddy's wedding ring, which he had left on the windowsill that night. I can feel Patsy on my shoulder, guiding special people to me to help and guide me through. He's always there giving me strength. When I was picking Patsy's headstone, I wanted to write on it, murdered by the IRA. But instead, I had them engrave the words, Lord, may he be an instrument of your peace. I pray he did not die in vain. I always want to say after I watch this, that this is the work of the true peacemakers. The people who are at the grassroots level doing the most difficult work, finding the strength within themselves to connect across these great divides. I think oftentimes we think of peace as being made by people in government and authority, but to me, this is peace. And to have uh, Kathleen say, uh, I wanted to write Murdered by the IRA, but instead I wrote, may he be an instrument of thy peace. That to me is the essence of what peace is. When we were working on this project, with all projects, I keep my ears open and my eyes open to anything that the performers say. And one day Kathleen told me that people had written to her from all over the world after Patsy's death, and she had saved all the letters. So we read through them and we chose, I think about six or seven of them, maybe even more, that were actually read by the other performers at different stages during the performance. You heard one of them today. I think one of the things that was amazing and shows the concentric circles of how peace building can happen is after the film of the show premiered on BBC, I got a letter from a principal of a school saying that he had written one of those letters that he heard when he was a young boy. And I remember I had the chills and I went, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe that. So many years later, he recognized himself and he asked if he could meet with Kathleen. And since that time, um, some of the performers have gone many times to that school to do workshops. You just never know, never know when one story is going to deeply be the seed for an unfolding in someone else's story. So on that same note, when I came back to the US, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was quite lost after being in Northern Ireland for a while. And then Philando Castile was murdered. He was a young African-American man who was killed by police in his car while his kids watched. And the video of that uh, killing went kind of viral on social media, and many of us saw it over and over, re-traumatizing people all over. And a few days later, police were killed in Dallas. 
and I remember my heart just breaking for the state of our world. And I thought about this woman that I had worked with many years before, in fact, 10 years before, named Altavid Slav Craighead, who's a woman of color who had lived through the murder of her brother and was also a police officer. I didn't even know if I still had her phone number, but I went into a kind of a deep prayer state. And the next thing I knew, my hand was reaching for my phone and I was scrolling down and I found that I had her number and I texted her and I said, my heart is breaking thinking about what you, you must be going through now. And I didn't mean to write this, but I said, do you want to partner on a new project? And within 30 seconds, I got a text back saying yes. And that was in 2016, and she and I have um, become deep, fast friends, and we uh, created and produced a, a piece called Walk in My Shoes with people of color and police that, that were black, white, male, and female in Philadelphia. And it was an incredible project that is still kind of having ripple effects and we're, we're bringing it on. But when we started to uh, work on it, we had trouble at first uh, attracting police who wanted to do it. And we were doing listening circles. And one day we, we did a listening circle and I just decided I'm gonna play Robin Young's part, who was uh, a, 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 our RUC officer and a PSNI officer living in Northern Ireland who had been in We Carried Your Secrets, our very first piece here. And his, his piece is also about PTSD and what being on the body recovery team uh, at Coach Quinn had done to him. And I played that part and this uh, white police officer, William, who we call Cause, I uh, just started crying, I and mean, we were all crying, but he was sobbing, and it turns out that he had also served in Iraq and also had a lot of PTSD and begged to be part of the show. So today, he is one of the people's stories that you will see, and it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Robin. And the other person's story that I'm gonna focus on is Hakeem Ali, uh, a wonderful man who had been in another one of my projects, and his story really is about the legacy of slavery and racism and the horrors of how the U.S. has been founded on slavery and lived with its ramifications for 400 years. Um, and his piece is about ancestors and about the possibility of change. And I'll weave it together first with a little bit of a trailer so you see the whole project and then a little bit about the end. So this is Walk in My Shoes. These divided times, these times of hatred and violence, didn't just start now. They were embedded in the founding of this country. And my own family's history was a part of it. I was frantic. I kept walking around, searching the city. You work your tour, you might help five, Philip, 10, 15 people. Where are you, Philip? Some days I am scared. I would have walked forever to find my son. He was hanging from a tree. You don't care about your job. A body was found in the school. Can I do good? Because our lives are at stake. But it had already what been written. The guys in the other car were firing back. The path back. was already chosen. And she screamed. Someone took oh Philip's God, life. Don't kill and him. no one took it seriously. Don't kill him. Over and over in your head. I don't know if there's such a thing as a good cop. Because good cops will stop bad cops from doing bad things. Prison is a vicious, abnormal place. And I don't ever want to go back. My five-year-old daughter looks at me and says, stay safe, Daddy. We're trying to change the mindset of these gang members. I immerse myself in these kids' lives. I remember my grandmother saying, I made baby my boys, but my girls, they will be strong. I didn't want to entertain the idea that this police officer would kill me in front of my son, but it's real. And all I want to do is help as many people as I can. I want to be able to look in the mirror and not just see a good officer, but a good person. I hurt a lot of people. There's some things you can never atone for. The year was 
was 1909 on a farm in Georgia. My dad, 16 years old, was living with his extended family of aunts and uncles, cousins and brothers. They were sharecropping on the land where they had lived and worked for years. One of my dad's cousins, his name was Lawrence. He was real light-skinned, and he could pass for white. And he did it many times. And whenever they wanted something special from this guy, Mr. Johnson, that owned the land, they would send Lawrence up to negotiate for him, you know? This day, they wanted to get two extra days off of work. So they sent Lawrence up, talked to Mr. Johnson, and they waited for him to come back. And they waited. And they waited. But he never returned. For two whole days, he was missing. So all the family got together and they went looking for him. And one of the cousins found him. He was hanging from a tree in the woods. He'd been shot many times and he'd been castrated. The family, they cut him down and they buried him right there. And then all the young men in the family, it's about 25 of them, went back and got guns and they came back to that little town and they started shooting and killing and shooting. When the smoke cleared in the end, 30 white people was dead. Three of the cousins got killed by the police. A lot of the other ones got wounded and locked up, but six of them got away. My dad was one of those six. So that's how my father, at age 16, changed his name, changed his identity, and escaped up north. He never saw or heard from his family again. Now, when he told me this story, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't imagine my father killing anybody. But when he was telling me the story, he was looking me right in the eyes. He was crying like a baby. I understood a whole lot more about my father that day. I could see in his tears that our family history was still coursing through his veins. Now listen, you can't hear a story like that or know about a situation like that without feeling something. Anger, outrage, rage, and the rage that I felt in me sent me down my own road of destruction. Now, I got my own story to tell. You see, I too was 16 years old. When I got caught out after curfew by the police, I was walking on from a party first thing I knew was these blinding lights in my eyes. And then my back was slammed against the wall and I heard these racist police saying, you black Sambo, you ought to be back in Africa. And then they started to beat me. And they beat me. And they beat me to a bloody pulp. And the only reason I think I'm alive today when one of them pulled the gun from his holster and was going to aim it at my head this old sister come down the street and saw him, and she screamed, oh my God, don't kill him. Don't kill him. But the beating they gave me that night left me with 165 stitches in my head, a fractured arm, cuts and bruises all over my body, and a heart scarred with hatred, intent on revenge. Rage, rebellion, and revenge was now running the show. For 45 years, I cycled in and out of prison, being locked up, abused, disrespected by the police on the inside as well as on the outside. The anger that built up in me made me do some of the most despicable things on this earth. I hurt a lot of people. I stood over people with my hands around their neck. 
They be begging for me to stop. Please, please stop. But I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop. I might not ever be able to make up for all the wrong that I did. <laughs> there are some things you can never atone for. I, I can't pinpoint the exact thing that made me turn around. Maybe it was me studying and obeying the tenets of my religious belief, which is Islam. Maybe it was me finally taking an accountant of the wrong that I did. Maybe I just got older and wiser. And maybe, no, more than likely, it was God's grace. All I know is that I'm no longer governed by a rage that I can't control. What started out as hatred and revenge and loathing has now changed into a desire to enhance life, to give back to the community, to fight for my redemption because it's never too late. This once cold, dead heart has come back to life. And all I want to do is help as many people as I can. I didn't understand that that helping people might mean that I have to work with the police. Now that wasn't an easy transition for me. But I found out that working with the police was a part of my own healing. And also, we might be creating a new paradigm that could be a healing for us all. Because it's never too late. Philandro Castile, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray. Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, I do this work for you. I'm in the gunner's turret and a vehicle is coming towards us and it's not stopping. I'm firing and firing. It's a hit. Things happen you don't want to see or hear or remember. The worst has happened. Then it's another day. I engage a vehicle. Boom! It blows up just as we pass it. It was loaded with mortar rounds. I'm calm when it's happening, but later, I can't stop shaking. It could have been over before it started. My wife has walked me back to bed. What did I do? What did I do? He was a 19-year-old kid. I'm 22. He's scared. I promise him that he'll be okay. I tell him to just breathe deeply and remember his tactics. I, I don't know, Sarge. I don't know if I'm gonna make it home. It feels better after we talk. Two days later, I'm putting away my gear. And then we hear his vehicle blow. It drove over a landmine. I see his face. I still see his face. Sometimes I have a bad dream and he's at the bottom of a bed on fire. I promised him he'd be okay. Why am I alive and he's dead? I put my wife through hell when I get back from overseas, but she stands by me. She reads my every mood and knows just what to do. I'm so blessed. I have all my limbs, but my head is messed up. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I see a monster. But what I'm really seeing is the war. You start out as a good person. You don't go over wanting to kill people. Sometimes when I come home from work, First thing I do is smell the top of my baby daughter Cassidy's head. She's my love bug, who can always bring a smile to my face. We tried so long to have her. After years of fertility treatments, we were trying to adopt. A baby was born and we were next in line, but the mother found out I was a police officer and she refused to give the child to us. It devastated me. So now when I go on duty and see neglected kids in crack areas, I get enraged. 
I'm running five, 10, 12 miles a day to get straight again. We get a call for a three-year-old who has stopped breathing. I look at my partner and he knows what to do and I know what to do and he grabs the kid and we quickly jump in the squad car. I drive off fast, lights and sirens as he does compressions in the back. We're flying down the streets. We pull up the chop and we hear the kid take a breath of air and I'm like, radio, we got breath. I'm running in the annual law enforcement memorial run. 143 miles from Philadelphia to DC to honor fallen police officers. For someone to be willing to take that extra step to kill someone in uniform, it's crazy. Killer may have had a rap sheet. We have a dead officer. I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. Sometimes one of the younger kids will come up to me and say, you don't understand what it's like growing up in the hood. You're white. I tell them I grew up in Kensington and it flips a switch. I'm at the call about someone who has a knife and is stabbing people. He's walking down the steps. Drop the knife! Drop the knife! He's coming at us. Time. Stand still. Take out my gun. I put my finger on the trigger. Drop the knife! It falls. Later, everyone is asking, why didn't you fire? I still felt like I had enough time. If you had taken a few more steps, I would have had to. Breathe. 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 There are protests about police violence. Some officers did some screwed up shit and I'm angry. You just put a target on every other police officer. One bad person and the media paints us all in the same light. But we can't second guess. There might have been a gun that you can't see on film. You only have a split second to make a decision. I'm always trying to make the right decision. I'm giving out toys and clothes we've collected for the people in my community. I'm giving my dinner to someone who's dumpster diving. I'm running. I'm breathing. I'm lifting. I'm trying so hard. My partner's there for me. My wife is always there. We've made love work. And it was almost over so many times. And it was almost over so many times. And it was almost over so many times. When I finish my 30 years of service, I want to be able to look in the mirror and not just see a good officer, but a good person. Any day I make it home is a good day. I don't need awards or ribbons on my chest, but in my time, I want to be able to ask, can I do good? And then I want to move to a nice, quiet place in the country. Sometimes in this city, there's so much killing, so much despair, so much heartbreak. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible of Ezekiel and the dry bones. When Ezekiel walked into the city, the bones of the people were everywhere. Ezekiel was asked a question by God. Can these dry bones live again? Can life be breathed back into them? We live in a time of many different types of dry bones. The dry bones of homelessness, those who are locked behind prison walls, the dry bones of mass incarceration and inequality, the dry bones of war, those who die on city streets, people who have lost their minds with grief, people who have no health care, old men and women who die alone in their homes or in nursing care facilities. But the question remains, can these dry bones live again? Can life be breathed back into them? We think of the police officers who put their lives on the line every night for us. Will they make it back home safe? And I think of the people all across this country who've been harassed and abused by police, people fighting for justice, children in underfunded schools being left behind before they ever start, 
people living in poverty, families in hospitals praying over their sick and loved ones, people living in addiction. Can life be breathed back into the systemic wounds of our country that was built on the genocide of one people and the slavery of another? For those who serve this country and live with the scars of war, all my immigrant and refugee brothers and sisters who have lost their land and a sense of safety. To the gang member who wants to survive in these streets just one more night. To those living with trauma, disability, neglect, depression, mental illness, bullying, anger, or hatred. And to all those in the service profession who put their lives on the line every day for us. Doctors, nurses, police, firefighters, teachers, activists, men and women who support us in this great time of need. It's time for us to breathe life back into these dry bones. It's time for us to revive love and care for all humans and living things on this planet. The river, the mountains, snakes, bird, the earth this planet itself to resuscitate it, to make this broken vessel whole, clean, and alive. It's time for us to breathe life back into these dry bones for all humanity. So in the end, maybe it comes back to, can we breathe together? Can we all exhale? Can we exhale all that holds us away from being our true selves, our most loving selves, our best selves? Can we exhale all that holds us as societies away from having a free and equal society for everybody? Can we look at each other in the eyes? Are you there? I am here. Can we share the space and find that moment together? And more than a moment, what can we, what can we dream together? If this work is about finding that blessing in the center of the wound and going through the darkness to finding the light, um, I just want to hold up all the performers who've been in Theater of Witness projects who have continued to hold the light as they have done workshops all over Northern Ireland and the same is happening in the United States, bringing this work to more and more people and hopefully the next generation. My other hope is that there's a way to internationalize some of Walk in My Shoes and perhaps do a piece with people in Europe connected with Robin Young from We Carried Your Secrets and the people that I've been working with in Philadelphia. And lastly, I want to come back to the Rumi poem, beyond all ideas of right and wrong, there is a field. I'll meet you there. OK, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Well, Tian and myself met, and the idea was that I was to present her with two questions, and we were to discuss those. And, but we sort of got carried away. We, we just met and talked and talked. 
and Elaine decided she wasn't going to edit it. And so this is the question and answer session. Okay? And I think I can say without fear of any con contradiction that we're all profoundly moved and could see the beauty in it and will always remember the last quotation about the field. Oh, and the field, that quotation of the field and come join me, let's meet together in the field. It's so, so reminiscent of Field Day Theatre Company here in the town and the idea of Field Day, the, the idea of people celebrating together and let's have a Field Day before we go out, as it were. And oh. it's like um, the, the idea of a field above a cliff, above an ocean, and a field in which you can play, and that the play is entirely safe, but, but, but ever so slightly risky, because we have to take risks also. We, we, can't, we can't be cautious and safe all, at all times. Okay, so I thought it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And it's great to see you again. And you've been doing this work for 35 years, my goodness. So how are you feeling about all of that? Uh, you know, it, it, it actually feels like it's my life. Like, I, I, I don't really separate the work from my life because like, I think if I hadn't been doing the work, I would never have come to Northern Ireland. I would never have met all of you. And how is that anything other than my life? You know, the people, right. the people that I've walked with, you know, I just feel like I have the luckiest life in the world. I, I used to always say um, I had been, in, I remember being in this uh, prison cell in Poland, uh, meeting with a man who had, hadn't had a visitor in 20 years. Oh. And I remember, um, I don't even remember that the translator was there, but obviously she was because I couldn't really speak Polish. But I remember thinking, oh my God, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. How did I, who grew up in an upper middle class Jewish background in, in New England, in the USA, end up in a prison cell in Poland? Like, what could be better than this, you know? <laughs> well, I can think of a few things. <laughs> it's that holiness of being with somebody and, you know, like, connect. so uh, I feel so lucky about that. And I want to say something about the field that you brought up. You know, when I was working with you back in Ireland, I remember you used to always say that um, Gary was on the periphery of the periphery. And you used to you used to get into this whole wonderful thing of the periphery of the periphery. <laughs> and I that has never left me. Like yeah. I think about that a lot. Like, what does it mean to be on the margins? And what does it mean to and and the people that I work with being on the margins and and I love the love the way you think about it geographically astronomically you know it it inspires me. Okay, that that brings me on to one of the questions I want to ask of you. That essentially, this whole process is about the uniqueness of each individual in it. So it's about each of us is unique and we live in a, so it's about that, that unique person, that unique individual, and about the unique place that he or she is from, be it Derry, Northern Ireland, Philadelphia, wherever it is. And it's about the uniqueness of the space and time that they're in. So all of that uniqueness in, in some ways is remarkable because almost like a contradiction, it's what you, it's what allows the rest of us to connect with that person. That, that singularity which they have, which each of, the, each of us has, is the point at which we connect. Mm. Mm. So I, I, mean, that, that's, I, I, I thought that, that the, particularly given what's happening in the States at the moment and the way in which that connects with our lives and has done, for, for the last several years, the last, well, I suppose, 30 years or so. And, and we know that, we know what it's like on the streets. We know, we know the tension of the, all of that and the pain of the, all of that and the frustration. And, but people everywhere can connect, can, can connect with it and do. So how does this happen? Well, you know, I think, 
I think it's only when we find that common place of humanity where we're telling our own story that we do connect because otherwise it's this political, you know, kind of talking at each other. I, I remember when I came to Northern Ireland and I would first listen to radio shows and I went, oh my God, <laughs> nobody is even listening to each other. They just, they literally talk at the same time. I mean, and that's what we do a little bit pretending to be a little more polite in the US, but it's actually the same thing. People don't really listen. It's this side and this side. And and you know what the other person is saying because there's no, um, yeah, there's no personal in there. And it's when somebody is telling their personal story and you see how something has impacted them and you feel like, oh, that that could be me. Oh, yeah. Then, then our minds can have some space in them to potentially change. Mm -hmm. um, so I really believe in this work more than it, more than ever before. And I have to say, I got really scared about doing Walk in My Shoes, even though I felt a calling to it. But I kept thinking, I'm a white woman. How do I dare do this work? But luckily, my partner, Altabeats, is, is a woman of color and a, now a police inspector. So, um, I, I mean, we couldn't have done it without each other. But but it's, it is like it, it's, everything is so fraught now. And um, if I think, oh, but all we're doing is telling individual stories, uh, then it changes it. And I have to say, when we show the film, people just, you know, we, the whole film, people usually are sobbing in their seats and they're saying, what, what can I do? And I guess that's it. Like, if it can provoke some action for people, I don't know what that is, because we're all so different. Yeah. Maybe the individual stories, but within a process of creating a group. And you meant you use the word sacred to define the group, that, that's sacred space. And, and sacred has, has different meanings, I suppose, at different times. For you, what, what does it mean and how is it sacred? It's a very unusual word to choose. Well, I always think when we when we actually enter the room and make a circle, which we do for every rehearsal, every even before we do a performance, uh, we kind of leave the re our regular mind out, and we start this process of having a minute of silence, and in that silence, getting in touch with what the positive gift is that we're bringing into the room. And I know it's so easy to come in with, oh my God, I was stuck in traffic and oh, this horrible thing happened. And there's something about like all deciding we're going to leave that. We're starting with a ritual where we're all completely saying this, we will never in the entire history of the universe have this moment back again. We are here together. We can do this together. We can look at each other in the eyes and we're all being real with each other. That to me is the ultimate of sacredness. Um, yeah. Yeah. And 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 because it it is so sacred that we're we're being real with one another, that space has to be protected. Yeah. It, 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 uh, and so theater witness is about protecting the space and yet opening it up. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's, in a sense, it's full of these wonderful contradictions, mm. which, which uh, allow all of us to connect with it. Yeah, the opening up doesn't happen for a while. You know, first it's just one-on-one -on -one with one person and me. And then in Northern Ireland, with most people, I had to meet one or two other people before we even met as a group, so they felt safe. And then it's just the group. And then when they're ready, when they've rehearsed their stories, when, you know, we've done a whole process, then it opens up to the whole. But if we had opened up to the whole at the beginning, it would be a disaster. Um, and if I even sometimes told people about what we were doing or what I'm thinking, sometimes you have to let something just take its own time. Um, and I just always want, I, you know, I just have to kind of publicly thank you, Eamon, because when, when I was in Northern Ireland, it was so hard. I really didn't know what I was doing. I, you know, in so many ways I was in so over my head and I trusted you. I completely, 100% trusted you. And I felt like when I really did have to say something about how things were impacting me or what I was questioning, I always knew I was gonna get a straight answer and that, that you have my back. And so that, that was an opening. 
you know, without giving away confidential things, there was a space for me to be safe. Mm. And I couldn't- you, Thank you for myself. that, yeah. But I'm really interested in how, how you judge, maybe it's just an instinct you have, uh, when, when is it ready? When is this group ready to go public? When is this person ready to share their story? And uh, when, when are the rest of us ready to listen to her or to him? Well, it kind of works the other way because, because of funding and needing to have a theater and everything. <laughs> you know, we know the date long before we've started the work. And so then my job is to get us to that, spa to that place. And um, I kind of just have an intuition, like I never actually write it out, like, oh, by this date, we have to have this and this date. But I kind of just know from having done it a lot, okay, by this time, people have to be, everybody's part has to be written. And at this part, everybody has to know their part. And this is the last day people can make changes because th there's so much that's happening. Um, but it's always magical because the group becomes its own group. And at a certain point, I am useless in the group which I hate, but I get <laughs> By the time they're performing, they have to save each other on stage if somebody yeah. makes a mistake. Or one time we were in Northern Ireland, we were performing. I just remember this in the, the, there was a problem with a video and the video was a huge part of what was happening. And I was in the audience kind of, and I had no idea, oh my God, what is gonna go on? And the women on both sides just looked at each other because they were far away across the stage from each other. And they just did something. And it was the right thing and how they did it, I do not know but that that's the closeness that they developed together yeah you see on, on the film uh we saw yourself in the old star factory yeah. working looking out at the foil and the, the snow and the slopes and so on it was an absolutely beautiful picture and i uh, was thinking we really miss that woman from this time <laughs> You're going to have to come back here. I would, oh, in a flash, in a flash. Yeah, I know. And I, the, doing this project, being part of this conference has made me reach out to some of the performers and, you know, just talking to any of them and talking to Elaine, talking to you. It's like, oh, my heart. Yeah, I just, and, and I do have an idea. So I, I, Whoa. I, I do <laughs> think there might be a way we can do across, across the ocean project together, which yeah. I think so thrilling. So we'll have to con continue this conversation off Absolutely. screen afterwards? <laughs> Forever. It doesn't yeah. ever end. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Taya, thanks for all that you've brought us, the, the, the learning, the insights, the joy, the absolute beauty. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Taya, and thank you. Okay, we'll move on now. To Hector. Thank you all. <laughs>